Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Shelley Wilkinson, Director of Sales with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it's our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Tom Erb, President of Talent Resources. For over 18 years, Tom specialized in talent solutions for companies in a variety of industries, sizes, and types. As an executive for two of the largest staffing and recruiting companies in the country, he's worked with some of the most recognizable and well-respected companies in the United States. In 2010, Tom formed Talent Resources, a consulting firm that helps organizations maximize their talent ROI through better recruitment, selection, onboarding, and retention processes. And as a recruiting expert, Tom's presented at the American Staffing Association, National Association of Personnel Services, and TechServe Alliance National Conferences. Tom's also the past president of both the Ohio Staffing and Search Association, as well as the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. Talent Resources is a consulting, training, and coaching company focusing on the staffing and recruiting industry. With over 18 years in the staffing industry, Talent Resources has the expertise and proven track record of success needed to help their clients grow their business. In today's Industry Insider webinar, Tom will discuss how the staffing industry has become commoditized, and you'll discover how you can get out of the commodity rat race, including how to separate yourself from the competition, how to negotiate from a position of strength, and how to create true demand for your service. By the end of the session, you'll see how your staffing firm can continue to grow with significantly higher margins and thrive in a commoditized industry. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. So with that, I am going to turn the floor over to Tom. All right. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, and thank you to Tricom Funding for asking me to speak. Uh, I believe this is the second or third time that I've spoken on one of these sessions for Tricom, so I, I must have uh, must have done well enough to get an invitation back uh, again. So thank you very much. So what we're going to talk about today is is really about how the staffing industry has become commoditized, and, and I don't think I'm I'm telling a secret to anybody here that's on the call, uh, but also how you can really separate yourself and, and how you can get away from it. And, and I'm going to give examples throughout of specific companies that have actually been able to differentiate themselves and have been extremely successful in getting out of the commodity rat race, as well as I'll talk about a few things that I've done over my career uh, that where we've been able to differentiate ourselves in a way um, that allows us to, to not play that commodity commodity game. So let me make sure this works. It does. So, um, so how did we get here as an industry? How did we become commoditized? Well, there's really multiple reasons why this has resulted. And I've been in the staffing industry now for about 20 years, and for those of us that have been in the staffing industry for a while, uh, we've seen it change. And, and 20 years ago, the margins were, uh, in some cases, two to three times what they are today. And, and so it's, it's pretty obvious for somebody who's been in the industry for a while that it has become a commoditized industry. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. And the first one is that buyers are just, in general, more price conscious today than they have been in the past. I think a big part of that is because of the, the recession that we went through. It was one of the worst downturns in the economy uh, that we faced uh, as a country. And because of that, there was a prolonged period of time where people had to really pay attention to pricing. And so price became more and more important over that time, and, and that has not gone away as the economy slowly improves. Another reason is that procurement or, or purchasing and human resources keep taking on a bigger and bigger role. Uh, some of that is because of the, the uh, price conscious uh, change in, in, in the, um, uh, among companies, but part of it also is just that 
as companies are trying to consolidate staffing, as they're trying to become more efficient, you're seeing that, it, that it's uh, steering more and more towards procurement and HR. And one of the things about dealing with procurement and human resources even is that many of these professionals are be now being trained in negotiation skills. And so we're going up against people who have much more training than typically in our industry we give to our sales reps and to our managers and to our recruiters. So we're, we have a disadvantage there when we're working with procurement and human resources. And in some cases, they're actually getting incented to reduce costs. The third reason is that companies are using staffing and recruiting differently. 20 years ago when I started in the industry, the, the most companies were using us on a temporary basis. They were placing an order to fill in for a big project that they had or maybe a peak season or somebody was on vacation. Temp to hire was starting to gain a little bit of steam, but it really wasn't used uh, from a strategic standpoint. And I remember in those days really talking to companies about, you really should consider us as part of your talent strategy. Well, it's really only been in the last few years that companies have started to look at that. And if you start to see the numbers in the staffing industry, uh, particularly coming out of the recovery, you can see that the companies are using us much more as part of their overall talent strategy. But with that, they're spending more money with us. And with that, there comes more scrutiny around those numbers. Vendor management systems and master vendor programs, let's face it, those are created in large part to commoditize uh, services. And I remember back years ago, we had a, uh, we had a national client that, uh, this was before vendor management systems, and they were trying to customize their procurement program to use staffing uh, to, to be able to order temporary employees. And they were showing us the demo, and we went through it, and at the end of them creating a job order, they clicked Add to Cart. And so that kind of gives you an idea of how much they were commoditizing it. They were looking at us the same as they ordered office supplies. And while vendor management systems and master service our master vendor programs have evolved over the years, it's still essentially the same thing as they're commoditizing our services. There's increased competition. It is, there are relatively no barriers to entry in our industry. The biggest barrier to entry is being able to, uh, to fund payroll. And so because of that and because of the attractiveness of our industry, it's going uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says it's going to be one of the fastest growing industries over the next 10 to 15 years. More and more people are coming into the industry, and more and more people are coming into the industry that do not have staffing experience. So it does a couple things. One, it increases the level of competition, but it also increases the competition that doesn't really know what they're doing and they don't know how to price things effectively. And I've talked to many, many companies over the past three and a half years since I've been doing consulting where they really have no idea how to price. And they're making it up as they're going along, and they're reducing their rates to the point that they get the business and have no idea that they're even losing money until it's too late. The last reason, the reason I'm going to really focus on today, because it's something that we have a lot of control over, is the lack of discernible differences between staffing and recruiting firms. Since I started my consulting business about three and a half years ago, I've talked with hundreds of staffing companies, uh, whether that's through consulting, through speaking, uh, they're going to conferences, and I'm always asking the same question, what makes you different than your competition? And I can tell you 99% of the time, they sound exactly the same. As an industry, we just sound the same over and over again. Which leads us to the next slide. If your prospect can't tell the difference between you and everyone else, how are they going to decide who to work with? If there are absolutely no differences between the two, and the answer is obvious, and, it, and it's what we're seeing, it comes down to price. So if you go to the store and you want to buy a, a widget and you've got two widgets side by side and you look at them and they look exactly the same, there's absolutely no difference, why would you pay 5% more for the one widget just because they say they're better on the packaging? And that's essentially what we're asking companies to do is we come out, we look exactly the same, we sound the same, and yet we're asking for more money when we're trying to um, trying to get out of the the commodity game. So how do we get out of the commodity rat race? Well, I'm going to talk to you about several steps. And the first step is sounds pretty simple, 
but it's important. It's refuse to play. And what I mean by refuse to play is you have to make a conscious decision in your organization that you are not going to play the commodity rat race. And talking to companies, I know that that's easier said than done. In our industry, in many cases, we never, we never come across a deal that we don't like. We find it very, very hard to walk away from deals. We find it very, very hard to, um, to say, you know what, we're just not going to play in that space. We're not even going to go after some of these companies because they're so price conscious that it doesn't make sense for us to do that. But in order for you to switch from the commodity sale to the value sale, you have to change your mindset and you have to change the mindset of your company. I work with uh, one of my clients that she knows she needs to increase her margins. She knows that she has to uh, th that she has to get away from the commodity sale, and yet she can never walk away from a deal. She can never turn something down, and she's always going in there and uh, and is going lower and lower and lower. So she is not able to make a conscious decision to refuse to play. There really are four different types of companies in the staffing industry. And this grid shows you what those four different staffing companies are based on how they price their business and how much control do they feel they have over pricing. So if you look down at the bottom left, you'll see the power list. And what this is, is this, these are companies that go in at low price. They, they're playing the commodity game. They're going in and asking what price is it going to take for me to get your business, uh, what markup are you currently at? They're asking all those types of questions, and then they're trying to go in a little bit lower. On the control side, they have they feel that they have very little control over it. These are the people that say it's a commodity industry, and that's just what I have to deal with it deal with, and I have to play the game. They feel they have very little control over. Uh, how they price things, and so they end up pricing very, very low. And so that's what I would label as the powerless. If you look just above them, there are companies out there that have high prices, high margins, but they have absolutely no strategy around it. They don't even realize that they're pricing it above what the industry maybe is on an average. And so I label these the price naive. They're out there, and I talk to companies when, when I'm talking about their margins. When they come in with higher margins, and I'm saying, wow, that's, th those are really good margins. How did you do that? And their answer is, well, I don't, what do you mean? That's just how we've always priced it. I just picked the price, and that's what I've gone with. That's great that they've been able to do that, but it also puts them in a very vulnerable, vulnerable position because, as we know, it just takes one or two uh, low-priced competitors to come in, undercut them, and pretty soon – uh, if they haven't created a strategy and created a value proposition around why they're charging that, they're going to have to cut their rates or they're going to lose business. So eventually that catches up to them, and many times they end up following, falling down into the powerless. Over on the right-hand side at the bottom, you've got your low-cost providers. These are companies that have made a strategic decision to compete based on price. And when I ask people who comes to mind, not in our industry, but outside of the industry, what company comes to mind? The same company comes up all the time, which is Walmart. Walmart has made a concerted effort and a strategic decision to compete based on low price. And they do that a few different ways. So they've changed their cost structure is the biggest thing. They go based on high volume. They go based on targeting people that, are, that, that want the low price. They've created entire marketing campaigns around that, and on the back side, they've been able to buy in volume and reduce their prices enough uh, of what they're paying so that they can make margins. They've been able to make it work. I can tell you in my experience in the staffing industry, there are very, very few companies out there uh, in staffing that have made a strategic decision to compete on price. There are a few. There are some that are out there and do that, but typically they tend to fall more into the powerless than they do the low-cost providers. And then up in the top right-hand corner, this is where we want to be. These are the non-participants. These are the companies that said, I'm not going to play the game. Hey, listen, I maybe won't have the volume that I want, at least in the beginning, 
but I'm going to make up for that with high margin and good business. My price is going to be high, and I, I'm making a strategic decision to only uh, to only sell based on value and to turn away the other lower cost business. So that's where we want to go. We want to be up in that non-participant area, and there are companies that do it very well, and you can do it well. If you're not there yet, that's uh, that's what you want to shoot for. So what do these companies have in common? We've got Apple, we've got Target, Domino Sugar, and then Robert Half. So all of these are very recognizable names. They're all in different industries. But what they have in common is that they are all highly profitable organizations in industries that are considered to be highly commoditized. And let's take a look at each one of them real quick. So think about Apple, and I'm, I'm a big Apple fan. I'm a, uh, I have several MacBooks. I, ha I have my iPad. My wife has an iPad. I have iPhone. Uh, but if you look at it, go to a Best Buy or a similar type of store, and what you'll see if you compare the prices with Apple is that there's typically a, anywhere from a 20 to a 40% premium on their products. Uh, a similar MacBook, uh, a MacBook that's similar to to a, um, a PC laptop or, or a, uh, a Windows-based laptop is typically going to be several hundred dollars more, even though it has the same types of specs. But they have created a perceived value that resonates with their customers that allows them to charge that premium, even though they're in a commoditized market. Target, we just talked about Walmart being a low-cost provider from a strategic standpoint. Well, Target has gone the other way. They said, you know what, that's not the audience that we're going to go after. We're going to look at more uh, focusing on style. We're going to focus on the way that the uh, different way as far as how the, how the stores are laid out, the different types of products that we have. And because of that, they've, they've been able to be much more profitable, and they've been able to get out of uh, what has traditionally been a commoditized market. You see an organization like Kmart or even Sears, which now owns Kmart, they've tried to go head-to-head -head with Walmart, and you see how that's turned out for them. They are pretty close to not being in business any longer. Domino sugar. When you talk about a commoditized industry, there is nothing more commoditized than sugar. But if you go to your grocery store and you take a look in the sugar aisle at all of the different sugars, you'll see Domino Sugar typically will charge 10 to 15, 20% more than all of the other sugars. And it's sugar. It's, it's uh, Sure, you can talk about refinement and, and certain things, but at the end of the day, it is probably what you think of uh, when you think of commodities first. And then lastly, Robert Half in our industry. Robert Half's done a fantastic job. They've made a strategic decision not to be commoditized, not to take high volume, low margin business or any kind of low margin business. They um, they stand very firm on their pricing, and they've been able to do extremely well uh, over the years with that model. So step two is to adopt an abundance mentality. What I mean by an abundance mentality is there, there are two different types of mentalities you can have. You can have a scarcity mentality. Uh, when it comes to business, which means uh, there's a finite number of companies out there that can work with us, and so we need to treat each opportunity like it's gold, and we need to do whatever it takes to get that business. On the other hand, an abundance mentality means the opposite. It means there's there's plenty of business out there. We need to have so much going on. We need to be going after so many different opportunities, and our pipeline it should be so full that any one or two deals does not impact us and our, and our ability to be successful. What you find is that most staffing companies have a scarcity mentality because they don't have enough stuff going on in their pipeline. They don't have enough opportunities and enough deals going, and so they become very dependent on the few deals that they're working on, and it becomes so much more important for them to close those deals. If you have a large number of deals that are in the pipeline, then any single one of those doesn't carry as much significance or as much, as, as much importance. So you need to, to shift your mindset to an abundance mentality. Your greatest strength or weakness is your ability to walk away. 
the problem from a negotiating standpoint when you're dealing with a client is that they typically have all the leverage because how many of us are guilty of going in and saying, um, I want to earn your business. I'll do whatever it takes to be your business. I want you to be my client. What's it going to take to get your business? What, what markup are you at currently? If I can beat that markup, can we work together? These are all things we say in, in our industry. And so what happens is we very quickly take this, this needy approach that we need your business more than you need to work with us. When you can change your mindset and say, I'm willing to walk away, and you approach a deal as if you can walk away from it, then that evens the scales from a negotiating standpoint, and it changes the conversation. It changes the tone of the conversation. I can tell you that the best deals in my career, some of the best deals are the ones that I actually walked away from or threatened to walk away from. Because once you have that power, it really changes the way that you can approach the entire discussion. Step three and what we're going to focus the most, uh, most time on here is building a killer value proposition. I talked about it earlier the, that of all the companies that I've talked to in the staffing industry, the vast majority of them uh, really don't have a true differentiator. And if you don't have a true differentiator, you really can't build a strong value proposition that resonates with prospects and clients. So it's critical that you identify what your differentiators truly are. And if you don't have them, then you figure out, okay, how am I going to create a differentiator? What am I going to do differently that I can then create a value proposition that's going to resonate with prospects? So value proposition is essentially the unique value that a business offers its customers. And there are two key words in this definition. The first one is unique. Um, if you are providing a value to businesses or to, to customers or potential customers, but it's not unique, then you're just the same as everybody else. It, it basically is a, uh, isn't just an essential feature uh, of your business. So if you're going out there saying we background check everybody, well, uh, you know, almost everybody's background checking everybody. We do, we do skills testing. Well, just about everybody's doing skills testing out there. You know, that's a value, certainly, but it's not a unique value. So unique is the important part. The other part that's, that's important to it is value. Uh, there actually has to be a, a perceived value by the customer. You could be doing something that's unique, but if the customer does not perceive a value and a value that he's willing to spend more money on, then it really doesn't help you out from the standpoint of differentiating yourself and getting out of that commodity rat race. So how do we figure out what our value proposition is? So we want to ask ourselves some questions. First thing is, who am I competing with? Uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? And I was in, um, I worked for two staffing companies for a total of 16 years and, and uh, in the Columbus, Ohio market. And I thought I knew my competition pretty well. And so we tried to sell against that. And here's one of the things that I, I've found since I've left uh, since I left the staffing company and started consulting is one, I didn't understand my competition nearly as well as I thought I, I did. Uh, and because of that, I was in some cases was trying to sell what I thought was unique value, which in reality wasn't really unique, really that unique. Uh, and I also in some cases underestimated my competition and in other cases I overestimated my competition. So you want to first take a look and say, okay, who am I competing with? And then you really want to get to know what their strengths and weaknesses are. And you can do that through doing, through, uh, through doing um, shops, through, through shopping them over the phone or in person, uh, obviously through checking out their website, uh, through talking to customers that have worked with both of you and ask them, what's, what's the difference? What do we do better? What do they do better? and really get an understanding, because if you don't understand what your, your competition is offering and what their strengths and weaknesses are, you really can't create differentiators. You, you don't know what is a differentiator. So then once you figure that out, then you say, okay, what do we do different and what do we do better? Um, and it's not just about what do we do different or better, but is it quantifiable? Can we, can we put it in a way that basically we're proving it? Because let's face it, prospects don't believe us when we talk about ourselves. 
Uh, we don't believe salespeople when they're talking about their product or their service. You have to be able to quantify it. You have to be able to prove it. So if you find that what makes you different or better is that your uh, turnover rate is significantly lower or your time to fill is faster, well, can you quantify that? How much faster? And can you actually have statistics that, that back that up so that people are more likely to believe those than they are for you to just say, hey, listen, we're, just, we're a better company uh, than what you're dealing with right now? We also want to take a look at what gives us credibility out there. Is it uh, maybe the, the amount of time that we've been in the industry? Is it that we, are, we specialize in a particular niche? Is it that uh, we have high tenure among our employees? Is that, that we, we provide them with special training or they're all certified uh, as staffing professionals? What is it that gives us credibility? And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. And then what's important to the client? When I was at a national staffing company, I um, was doing sales for them, and this was a while back before customer portals were pretty common. We had one of the early customer portals, and it was a, it provided a lot of different reporting functionality that where people could they could go and get almost real time reporting, and they could customize it a little bit, and they could uh, download it into an Excel spreadsheet or print it off or whatever. And it was 24/7, and so we thought this was great technology. We went out and we sold it like crazy as a, as a differentiator. And what I found over the course of time was that. Um, our clients didn't care. They thought, oh, well, that's pretty cool, but it, it, they never went and accessed it. Um, it never landed us a deal. And the reality of it was was that if they wanted a report run, they'd pick up the phone and call one of us, and we'd run the report for them. So it, it really wasn't important to the client. It was, it was unique, but it wasn't necessarily a value to the client. I, I think that's changed some as people have become more technologically savvy, uh, and people do reports on their own more. But at, at that time, it was probably a little too far ahead of its time and just didn't have the value we thought it did. And then lastly, how can I clearly state this value proposition in 10 to 15 seconds? And the reason why you want to do that is because that's about all the time you're going to get when you're calling somebody and you talk to them live on the phone, if you ever get anybody live on the phone again. Uh, it's also about the amount of time that, that somebody's going to listen to your voicemail before they determine whether or not they want to listen to the rest of the message or delete it. And it's typically when you're introducing yourself, you, you talk for you know, 10 to 20 seconds about what you do, so it's, it's kind of your elevator pitch as well. So you want to make sure that you can succinctly say what makes you different and why that's a value to that person. Let me give you a quick hint. It's not quality. Quality is not what differentiates you. I have talked, as I've said, to hundreds of staffing companies, and the vast majority of them say, say quality is what differentiates them. It's the quality of their placements. It's the quality of their team. It's the quality of their in, in candidate pool. Whatever that might be, everybody is saying that. Everybody. Your worst customer or your worst, uh, uh, your worst competitor, the person that you – think does the most damage to the industry and to your market, they're going out there and selling on quality. Quality has become an absolutely meaningless word, uh, in, not just in our industry, but in other industries. There's nothing to back it up. Nobody backs it up and everybody says quality. However, that being said, there are times when you can use quality. But let me give you an example. Ford, uh, Ford has really changed their perception over the past several years. And they've really focused on quality. Um, how has that resulted for them? Well, they had their best quarter last year since 2000. Their gross margin increased 10% year over year. They launched a Your Ideas initiative that, that engages with customers and, and prospective customers as far as giving them ideas and how they can improve quality. Uh, now they're consistently rated one of the highest satisfaction ratings in the auto industry. Their cars are consistently getting awards. The Ford Fusion was car of the year in a couple of publications last year. The reason why this is different is because they are able to quantify quality. They're able to back it up. When they say, hey, we have higher quality, they can back it up with statistics. They back it up with, uh, with awards that they've won. They back it up with all of these different recognitions. So the only way that you can sell quality is if you can quantifiably back it up. So how do we create that value, that killer value proposition? There's five steps to it. First is to identify your differentiators. 
The second is to determine the benefit or the value to your client. Okay, so what, what do they actually get out of the fact that you're different? Then you create the quantifiable value proposition. You figure out how you're going to market it. You market it like crazy, and you make sure that you commit to the message. Here's some example of some differentiators in our industry, and I'm going to go into more detail about each one of those and give you examples. Um, industry specialization, this is a huge one. Um, are you specializing in a particular area, uh, in a particular industry, in a particular skill set, particular niche? Is there something about your service team that differentiates you from the competition? We're in a high turnover industry, uh, so if you have a lot of tenure, if you have a lot of experience, that can be a differentiator for you. High profile clients, um, I'm the biggest name dropper in the world. I think that there's no quicker way to create credibility than to uh, than to talk about the high-profile clients that you've had and how long they've been clients of yours. Awards and certifications, both both for your team as well as for your company. Uh, testimonials, you know, we talk about testimonials all the time. Everybody knows we should have testimonials, but um, few people actually do go out and get testimonials, and even fewer do anything with them once they have them. And then unique service offerings. Do, do you offer something that's different from your competition that provides value to uh, to your um, to your prospects and to your clients. So let's start with industry specialization. Uh, the first thing you want to do is identify your niche. And you know, most companies don't think about this a whole lot. And I've talked to a lot of staffing companies that, say, that initially they say, well, I don't have a niche. You know, we're a general staffing company. We do it all. You, you bring in an order, we'll fill it. Uh, I've actually had companies that say, you know, we're we feel that our differentiator is the fact that we can fill anything. And um, while I understand that, um, one, I would say that you're going to be able to differentiate yourself much more heavily if you have some sort of a specialization. Uh, and two, you do have a specialization most likely. You just may not even know it. I, I was working with a client staffing company in New York City uh, a couple years ago, and we sat down and, and started going through identifying what her value proposition was. And we we talked to her, and I said, well, what's your specialization? And she said, I, I don't have a specialization. I I do everything. I do Chinese interpreters to accountants to uh, to receptionists. And I said, well, I, I would imagine that you probably do have some sort of specialization. She said, no, I don't. And she kind of got irritated. And I said, well, humor me for a second. I said, let's get your client list, and let's go through, and let's look at it by – let's look at each of them by industry and by skill set that you – uh, that you fill. And so we went through it, and what we found was that 40% of her business, so close to half of her business, was in real estate, uh, was staffing in the real estate industry. She hadn't even thought about that. But over the course of time, she had developed some expertise in that area and started to get more and more clients and started to do some networking in that area, but really hadn't even looked at it as a specialization. So we were able to take that uh, and and we're able to leverage that and create a marketing program for her and create um, a value proposition that allowed her to go out and position herself as an expert in that industry. And when you do identify area of specialization, then, then the terms that you want to start using are niche, specialized, area of expertise. So, you know, we're a, we're a, a niche real estate staffing company. Uh, our area of expertise is in the real estate uh, profession in the New York City area. Um, our clients include this, this, and this. And so you can start to have those discussions and, and create um, uh, create value very quickly. When I was uh, regional sales director for, uh, for one of the national staffing companies, I was building up the sales team in the market, and I had a lot of different a lot of different cities that I was looking for sales reps in, so we had a lot of advertisements out, and we were uh, actively recruiting. And so I, I started getting a lot of calls from recruiters. And what I found was that if a recruiter just called me up and they were just a, kind of a generalist recruiter, maybe they were maybe they focused on salespeople, but not in our industry, I, I ignored them. And, I, and I, I cut them off and I said, no, thanks, I'm not interested. Um, if they specialized in the staffing industry, I would talk to them and I would have dialogue with them and maybe even give them a chance to present some candidates. If they came to me and said, Tom, I 
see that you're looking for a sales rep in the Washington, D.C. market. Uh, I specialize in salespeople in D.C. for the staffing industry, and I just finished a search with ABC Staffing Company, and I have some good candidates. I would absolutely entertain those candidates, and I, I, and I would be much more interested in having them uh, help me. The, the, the fact of the matter is if you have um, – we like specialists. As, as human beings, we tend to want specialists. We want specialists for health care. We want specialists for our car. We want specialists for whatever it might be. So it's better to be a specialist than it is to be a generalist. doesn't mean you have to, to be exclusive in an industry or a profession. It just means that you specialize in it. You can have four, five, six different specializations. Um, but it's just an area of expertise that you have. And then once you've identified that and you start to build your message around it, then you get involved in the industry, you join associations, you, you reach out to those, uh, you go to different uh, events that they're having, trade shows, those types of things, and really push the fact that you're an expert in that area. Uh, this is a company, M-Force, a staffing company uh, that really focuses on industry specialization. They're number 353 in the Inc. 5000. They had almost 1,000% growth over three years, and they really push that they're a niche special uh, a specialty firm in engineering, design, drafting, and manufacturing. Uh, they claim two- to three-day turnaround on most requests just due to their network and their expertise. Service teams next. You know, there's, we have a pretty high turnover in our industry. You know, it's not uncommon to, to have our competitors at least turn over uh, their teams, in some cases, every six to 12 months. And so if you find that your, your team has high tenure, if they've been with you for a while, uh, you want to make sure that, that you sell that as a differentiator, particularly when you know of specific competitors that have high turnover, go after their, uh, their companies that they're servicing because likely that's an issue for their clients. Certification and awards, uh, you know, if, uh, are, your, are your employees certified? Are they CSP, CTS? TSC certified? Do they have some sort of certification um, that you can go out and differentiate yourself? Less than 5% of the industry is certified uh, in, a, in an industry certification. Do they have an industry background in that particular niche that they're focusing on? CBS years ago, CBS is now Staffmark, but years ago they had a call center division and they went out and they, their value proposition, their, their differentiator was that they were um, uh, that their recruiters were former call center managers. And so they would call and say, hey, I've been in your shoes. I've been on that side of the, of the table before. I know what you need. I know what your issues are. And it was a real differentiator for them. One of the ways that you can do this is to create a team overview. Um, put it in your marketing. Put it in your, your marketing collateral. Uh, make an, an electronic sell sheet that you can email to people. Put it on your website and really push the fact that that's a differentiator and why that that's a value to your, uh, uh, to your prospects and clients. Uh, the Callus Company is a company that actually um, uh, I'm quite familiar with. I've known the Callus team for, for years. They focus in industrial health care and also do some payrolling services. Um, they've grown at about 20% a year for 20 years. Uh, they are now one of, um, one of about the 20, 25 largest staffing companies in the U.S., and their average tenure for their executives is 15 years. For their staff as a whole, it's over 10 years. And every single one of their staff members are certified staffing professionals through ASA, every one of them. And it's a huge selling point for them. It's a huge selling point um, to be able to tell a uh, a prospective client that, hey, listen, if you start working with us, you're not going to have to retrain a recruiter every six months. Uh, you're going to have the same person most likely for a long time. High-profile clients. Uh, like I said before, I am the biggest name dropper in the world. There is no quicker way to get credibility and to get somebody's attention than to list off some high-profile uh, clients that would resonate with that prospect. And you know, if you think about it, it's, it's the same kind of concept psychologically as a, um, uh, as a celebrity sponsor or sort of celebrity spokesperson. You know, a celebrity spokesperson, the reason why celebrity spokespeople are so 
uh, are so successful in advertisements are people associated with them. And they say, well, if that person's associated with that organization or service or product, then obviously they're credible, and so I can, I can trust them. It's the same thing with being able to talk about your high-profile clients, how long they've been with you, do case studies around them, um, send people lists of them. Now, obviously, there are some clients that don't like you to do that, and that's fine, but um, uh, in most cases, you can share that information, uh, especially if you have a strong, long-standing relationship with them. So I'm a big name dropper. It's one of the first things that that would come out of my mouth when I was doing cold calls as a sales rep in the staffing industry. There's a company called Indivis, uh, a professional staffing firm. They're number 866 on the Inc. 5000. Uh, they've experienced over 350% growth the last three years. They list their client portfolio on their website, and they break it out by industry. And what that does is it allows people who are, are doing Google searches um, or even prospects that they can refer to the website to take a look and say, you know, this is an impressive client list. And it does do a lot for credibility. It does a lot for value, uh, for your value proposition. And it does a lot to, um, uh, to quickly build credibility and trust from a prospect that otherwise wouldn't believe you talking about how great you are. Going to awards and certifications, um, there is a very, very small percentage of staffing companies that have any kind of best of award. And there, I've listed a few of these best staffing firms to work for through staffing industry analysts, best of staffing uh, through Innovero and ASA, best places to work, best employers. There are a variety of different ones, Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award. There are a variety of different um, awards that you can apply for. And what these do, again, is create credibility beyond you just talking about how great your services are. Hire Dynamics is a, a staffing company out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dan Campbell is actually the new chairman of the American Staffing Association. and uh, They have a, a really impressive staffing company. They've done a great job of differentiating themselves based on awards that they've uh, that they've been able to receive. If you go to their website, you can see their awards are everywhere. They, they have them prominent on the website. Uh, they have been named the number one best staffing company to work for in the United States, number one best place to work in Atlanta and Reno. They were a 2012 Best of Staffing Client Award winner, 2012 Best of Staffing Talent Award winner. Uh, I haven't updated this, but actually they were 2013 as well. And it's all over their, um, their website and their marketing materials. And because of that, they've experienced significant growth, and, and they're doing a great job. Testimonials, we talked about this. The, the, we all know we should have them. We all know that we should be going out and getting testimonials and that we really should be pushing them. Um, one of the best ways to get credibility quick is to have your clients brag about you, not have yourself brag about you. A couple tips when you're getting testimonials is have the client be specific. If you are trying to sell a certain differentiator, then make sure that they reference that, that they talk about that that's the reason why they've selected you over other, uh, over other providers. Keep it short. Just make it one or two sentences. Uh, I would even say if you have, some, uh, have a client that's maybe hesitant to do it, clients are busy. Offer to do it for them. Just say, hey, tell you what, just tell me, just tell me what you would say. I'll put it into something. I'll send it back to you, and if you think it's okay, you can tweak it or you can tell me it's okay they're going to be much more likely to do that if you make it easy for them. Um, use the client's name, title, and company whenever possible. I, I, an anonymous testimonial doesn't carry a whole lot of weight. And I have had people that have always, they come back to me and they say, well, Tom, I, I don't want people to know who my clients are because uh, my competition could go to my website and see who my clients are. Well, listen, if you have a presence in your market, halfway decent presence, your, your competition knows who your clients are anyways. And I would think the absolute worst prospecting uh, would be to go to somebody's testimonials where they've, they've written a glowing review and go and try and convert them. I want to go to the clients that don't like them as much. I certainly don't want to go and try and prospect their testimonials. So uh, I, do, I don't carry a whole lot of weight to that. I don't think I've ever lost a client because somebody saw them as a testimonial and, and called on them. Ask for LinkedIn recommendations. That sometimes that's easier for them to do, 
but it also serves two purposes. Now you have a LinkedIn recommendation, and you can say, hey, can I use this as a testimonial as well in marketing materials and on my website? Several of my testimonials on my website are also LinkedIn recommendations and started out as LinkedIn recommendations. Whenever possible, categorize them by industry or specialization. What, I, what I've done in the past is put my testimonials by industry into, um, into a cell sheet, just an electronic cell sheet with my logo on it, and I include that as part of marketing collateral, and I'm specific to the industry that I'm targeting. So if I'm just focusing on a particular industry today or this week or whatever, and I'm sending out some mailings or, or I've got some appointments, then uh, those testimonials, I want them to be specific to that industry. And then use them absolutely everywhere. I use my testimonials in my brochures. I use them in my, my presentations, my proposals, on my website. I have them everywhere. Uh, I actually have photos of all of my testimonials. Uh, if you go on my website, you'll see there are actually photos of, uh, of all of them. I think there's one where I have their logo instead, of, maybe two where I have their logo instead of their picture. But in every other case, I actually have their picture to make it more real to people who are looking at those testimonials. Resource Pro does a fantastic job of this. If you go and check out their website, um, number 821 on the Inc. 5000 list, 380% growth. Um, they're a staffing and RPO company, and they actually have video client testimonials on their website that are, are well done and, and are pretty impactful. Uh, so I, I encourage you to check those out as well. Unique service offerings. Uh, yep. We all are offering the same things to our clients for the most part. We're offering recruiting. We're offering, okay, we're going to go out and, and recruit people. We're going to interview them. We're going to screen them. We're going to do background checks. Maybe we're going to do drug screens. We're going to do skills, skills testing. We're going to do all this stuff. Well, everybody does all that stuff. So what we do first-day checks. We do end-of-the-week checks. We do 30-day checks to, to make sure they're doing well. But what is it that really is going to differentiate you? Sometimes it's offering value adds that others don't. And here are some examples of that. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I had clients come to me and ask for piece rate pricing uh, when I was at the national staffing company. And we didn't offer it. We, we just said, we're not going to do it. It's kind of a pain for us to do. But companies that actually can do piece rate pricing, and obviously you have to follow all of the employment laws, you know, minimum wage and overtime and all those things. But if you can figure out something like piece rate pricing, uh, it can be a huge differentiator, um, or even project pricing. Employee transportation, uh, obviously that's going to be more in your light industrial skill sets than it would be professional skill sets. Off-peak coverage, I find that my clients, I, I have many staffing companies that uh, offer that and don't even really sell it as a differentiator. They don't, they don't charge for it. They just, what happened was most likely is one company, one client asked for it. They started doing it then and pretty soon. Other clients found out about it, uh, but they really don't sell it as a differentiator. And, and most companies don't have off-peak coverage, actual live coverage. Training, is there different types of training that you can do? We provided training for one of our clients. We did, um, uh, we did forklift certification for them. Now, it wasn't forklift certification that, that uh, satisfied the OSHA requirements of on-site forklift certification, but what it did do was it, gave our client more confidence that, um, uh, that these employees were fully trained in forklift. And uh, we had it done through a third party. We charged it back to the client, but it was something that our competition didn't do. Consulting services. Can you provide consulting above and beyond uh, what, um, uh, what you're tra uh, traditionally offering just from a staffing standpoint? And then RPO services, recruitment process outsourcing. Uh, are there different um, types of, of HR outsourcing services that you can provide them in addition to what you do. Now, in many cases, we're already doing it. We have expertise in it, so can we offer it up to them? A company out of Kansas City called Next Staff um, is the uh, two years ago was the fastest growing HR services company in the Inc. 500, and um, they experienced almost 1,200 percent growth in three years. Uh, they uh, are a traditional staffing company. They, they have more of a franchise model, but they also provide HR outsourcing services in a menu approach. And they, um, uh, it's very interesting what they, they offer to their clients 
is really a whole other level of service, and they've been able to differentiate themselves because they position themselves almost more as, as an HR services company than just as a staffing company, even though staffing is what drives their organization and their revenue. So as I finish up, I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Um, I, I just want to talk about the difference between differentiator and perceived customer value. So your differentiator is what obviously makes you different. But you have to think about what is the actual value to the client or the perceived value to the client because that's the important thing. And here's just a few examples of that. So um, if your differentiator is niche industry specialization, the true value to the client is that they're thinking, I'm partnering with an expert in the space with a comprehensive network of industry contacts. So they know the, the client feels like you are going to, they're going to have a better chance of getting the right person because of your niche specialty and that you are better, you should be better connected in that industry. You should be able to access candidates that they can access and that's the real value to them. Second one is impressive client portfolio. Um, what, what the client is really thinking is, I don't want to be the guinea pig. Most clients don't want to be your largest client. They, they want to know that you've already worked with other, with other companies, particularly in your industry, um, but they don't want to be the guinea pig. I had um, a friend of mine worked for a large, uh, huge retail organization in their procurement department, and he did a lot of, uh, a lot of RFPs, did a lot of um, uh, you know, vendor selection. And he told me once, he said, he was, you know, Tom, we're cutting edge in everything. We like to pride ourselves on being cutting edge except when we're selecting vendors. He said, we don't want to be the first one to, to select a vendor. We want to know that you've already been in our industry. We want to know that you're working with our competitors. And in most cases, in most industries, it's okay to, to share with them that you're working with their competitors. Now, there are certain industries, you know, you don't, want, you don't want to tell Coke that you're working with Pepsi. You don't want to tell UPS that you're working with FedEx. But in most industries, they actually want to know that you're in the industry, that you have experience, and, and it's okay to work with their competitors as long as it's not their hated rival. Um, strong testimonials. The value to the client is I can actually see evidence that you're a good, reputable company to work with. And it makes me more confident in my decision because many times, you know, in most cases, these people are making decisions that can have an act, impact on, on not only their business but on their own personal life um, and their job security. Sometimes these, you know, these are obviously big decisions many times. These are big purchases. Uh, and so they want as much evidence as they can ahead of time that, hey, listen, um, this seems like a really good company. So finishing up, how do we market our value proposition? You know, the first thing is be consistent. Once you figure out what your value proposition is, you want to, to have it be the same all the time. It's kind of like your your mission statement, but it's an external uh, it's an external message, and so it needs to be the same over and over and over again. So be consistent, be unwavering. Don't do it for a couple of months and then say, oh well, you know, maybe we'll tweak it a little bit, or oh well, well let's let's start some other things too. You have to be unwavering, and you have to give it time to take. It, it takes time for people to associate that value proposition to your company, and then do. But market it everywhere. Use it in, in different sales and marketing avenues like your website, marketing materials, uh, phone call and voicemail scripts, proposals, presentations. Put it everywhere because what you're really trying to push is that, uh, is that this value proposition that you have is worth more money than what they're paying for the competition and that it separates you from the pack and that they can make a decision based on something other than price. So with that, uh, boy, got five minutes left. I timed this perfect. Uh, I'll turn it back over to to Shelley or Amanda and open it up for questions. Yeah, Amanda's just checking to see now um, if any questions are coming in. But while we're waiting for any to come in, Tom, are there things that people typically will ask you um, that might be good conversation starters for some people to, to throw in some more questions? Um, well, I think, you know, I'm 
trying to think of anything specific. I, I think that the, one of the things that people do ask on a regular basis is just, uh, I think there's probably more questions around um, using testimonials, using real names, name dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, and and like I said earlier, uh, I think that the the benefit far outweighs, uh, outweighs the risk. Um, you obviously want to get permission from people to use testimonials and to use their name uh, and their company. Some companies don't allow it. Uh, they have policies against it. But other than that, I think that that's, to me, one of the one of the best ways to build credibility quickly. So, any questions? Are we waiting? Is is Amanda looking for oh, questions? Oh, Tom, sorry, we don't. We had a technical glitch here on our side. WebEx just booted us off the call. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Well. They just decided we were done. <laughs> so we're back. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> so you started talking about testimonials and um, how important it is to use testimonials, use real names, and that's where we lost you. So if you wouldn't mind reiterating your point, sorry. Oh, oh okay. Oh, I didn't know you lost me that way. Um, so, no, I was just saying the the probably the biggest question I get from from this session is just about the use of testimonials and and the use of of name dropping like I talk about, uh, and, and you want to you want to get permission from a testimonial standpoint, um, but uh, and, and if they're yeah you know, we all have certain clients where we go eh we better check with them to make sure they're okay with me dropping their name, but for the most part there's there's no real issue with. Uh, with name dropping, and as far as using testimonials on websites and, and in marketing campaigns, I think that the value and the benefit that you get from using real real names, titles, and and companies um, far outweighs any risk that you have of those uh, of your competitors reaching out to those people or, or finding uh, finding out who you're working with. Got it. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, it looks like we, we have not had any questions come in. I'm sure that everybody's probably kicking around everything that you talked about today and trying to figure out how they can implement all of your good suggestions. So we know that we've enjoyed working with you and uh, think very highly of, of the product that, that Talon Resources puts out there. So I think at that point we probably could wrap up. Um, so with that said, I would like to thank the participants in today's webinar, especially you, Tom, for sharing your knowledge of the staffing industry and uh, everything that Talon Resources does. The recording of the webinar is going to be available on our website, uh, tricom.com backslash resources. If you have any questions, if you'd like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation or the recording, feel free to contact Tom or me. Um, thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session entitled Advanced Workers' Compensation Claims Handling and that's on November 21st. Thank you again, Tom, so much. We really, really appreciate you doing this for us. And uh, thanks everyone else. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, everybody.